So thank you very much for inviting me here. It's nice. I've learned very much in these two days. Very much appreciated. Um, uh, yes, as uh, there are currently two projects going on in Gabla Uppsala right now. That, that's very important to say because uh, we have, as uh, said, uh, this uh, research project since five years, and there is also a very large contract archaeology project going on in Gabla Uppsala since 2012. So perhaps you've seen in the news large headlines about. Uh, monumental post rows in the landscape like Alex talked about. That's from the contract archaeology project. But fortunately, we're having a very good cooperation with our research project, which is focused around, around the manor area, and the contract archaeology project, which is focused around the medieval and early, yeah, Viking Age Vendel period medieval village. So um, I will show you. This map is uh, very good to keep uh, to have. Oops, to have a, to look at for, for you, you getting some uh, orientation points for Gamla Uppsala. It was made in 1709. It's probably I think it's Scandinavian's best ancient monuments map from its time. It's from the same years as Charles the Twelfth got beaten in Poltava in southern Ukraine. But you can see the central. Uh, burial ground, uh, Hergos and Greyfield with the three royal mounds and the thin mound. Loads of other Greyfields with small circles. All of those, we are talking about preservation and landscape things, and all of those Greyfields are destroyed today. There is nothing left of them. So it's only the Hergos and Greyfield which is more or less intact. There are a few others more preserved. And here you see the farms from 1709. At this point, it's still the largest village in Uppland. And of course, you can see the church here, the Romanesque church, or the remains of it, or the Romanesque cathedral. And uh, here is a map w over uh, where you can see where Gamla Uppsala is placed, quite far up north in, in the Malern Valley very close to Valsjärde in a well-known boat grave burial field. And uh, we can say more or less this, this map is based on the five meter contour line because we have the land rising in Sweden which is quite dramatically and the lake just south of Gamla Uppsala did exist in the, in the, until the 11th century, 12th century, but it has totally disappeared today. So we have a lake landscape quite close to Gamla Uppsala, but it is like other Scandinavian sites like Gudme, for example, and Uppåkra, it's placed in the inland. It, it is a couple of kilometers to, to the shoreline. And what Gamla Uppsala, in contrast to most Many of these central sites of Scandinavia from the Iron Age or the medieval period uh, is Gamla Uppsala not forgotten. It is a place mentioned in numerous literary sources going back to most of them the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. But it is it's frequently mentioned in medieval literary sources and sagas more than probably any other place in Scandinavia. It's considered an old legendary site in when uh, Sjordal Favin dictates, uh, recites his Inglingatal poem for, for the Norwegian king of Westfall. And uh, it's the core of the medieval royal property, earth mass, in the, called the Uppsala Erd, which probably had perhaps as a Viking Age state. And it's described as a major pagan site, cult site around 1080 by German cleric Adam Bremen sits in Hamburg and writes about the horrible Swedes who are not still pagans. And uh, Snorri Sturluson mentioned this as central thing sites in the 11th century. And it is of royal interest into the 16th century. We know Gustav Vasa, who is in the transition between the early modern and medieval period, he, he is up there at least 10 times holding assemblies with farmers. 
And we also know it is a bishop's side seat from 1123. Sorry for the last texture. Um, this is, as I've already mentioned, this is a very young landscape. When we, when we have the Bronze Age, it is a peninsula. It is more or less the inner part of the Baltic has its border where Gamla Uppsala is. But a few hundred years before Christ, the land rises and we a large plains, clay plains that are very fertile, but quite moist, excellent for farming and grazing, that, that those lands are exposed. And suddenly we see a very dense population uh, accumulation in this area. So you can see, here you see the early Iron Age situation. And every gray blob is a group of farms or single farms that we knew that we knew about, know about from the contract archaeology projects that have, for example, for the E4 running through the area. And as you can see, those each of these gray area settlement areas are quite dispersed. It's not a concentrated large settlement, but in overall, it's a very dense population, just as large in the early Iron Age as we probably have in the medieval period. But we see a clear change in the settlement pattern. And that this change, we do not really know where it begins. It's hard, really hard to pinpoint, but it seems to take place around 300 AD and continue into around 600. So gradually, as you see in the upper left picture, the, con the settlement is concentrated in a very distinct village area. And the dark grape, areas are the known settlement areas two years ago, three years ago, it haven't really changed. And the lighter gray areas are the known gray fields. In this area, in total, dense concentration of settlement remains and grave gray fields covers between some somewhere between fifty and sixty hectares. So it is probably already in the Vendel Viking period from the second century, it is one of the very largest vill villages in this area. And there is, a de there is a debate whether we can talk about urbanization or not, but it's very hard to see it as some kind of urban site because of the settlement structure. And m most distinctive features, or the most well-known fe features for a very long time, are the big mounds. And on this lighter picture, you can see the big royal mounds, the East Mound, the West Mound and the Middle Mound. In the 19th century, they were, they were called the Odin's Mound, and Thor's Mounds, and Frey's Mound. And we also have the Thing Mound up here, a large mound, 40 meters in diameter, very large flat surface, uh, which I believe is a burial mound from the beginning. So, um, and here you can see an impression, get an impression of the size of the royal mounds. We have two persons lying here by the foot of the West Mount. It, it was excavated for the Swedish, uh, Swedish authorities wanted to show every, every other archaeologist about Swedish royal king, royal burials when, uh, when there was a big congress in Sweden that year. So that's why they excavated it. But when they had, when they excavated the, the east and west bound in the 1846, 1848, and 1874, they were quite disappointed because all of them are cremation burials and the fine material is very fragmented. But when we look at it, it is a very, some of the finds are of very high quality. So there are reasons for talking about them as, as royals. And uh, for example, you see the cameos on the bottom left picture, which according to Geoffrey Spear, who is the great expert on Roman, uh, Roman cameos, they are not found anywhere between Uppsala and the Mediterranean. So it gives some kind of Sutton Who status for the Gamla Uppsala fi uh, finds. The quality is, is very high. And a very, a 
interesting thing about when we uh, compilate the datings for the mounds that are excavated, and three of the really big mounds are excavated so far. And it seems like all of them are dated between the late 6th and mid 7th century, perhaps the late 7th century. So it's a concentrated dating for, for those who are excavated so far. So, um, so I, I, th I think that, that, that represents the dating of most of the mounds in, uh, on, on the big ridge. And we also have a tendency when we look at this particular of the mounds that they are enlarged. So we see a pattern of overall, an overall pattern for the center that the decisions makers are ne really never pleased. They make a monument and then they need to be, uh, 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 build a big new one and they also decide to enlarge those existing monuments. So you can see here on the west mound, the biggest one, that it's built in two very different, uh, two phases with very uh, different materials. One phase where it's built out of uh, sand, and then they put another six meter on top of that with clay. So we see they're constantly enlarging the monuments. So, and then we have the other monumental area is what we call the royal manor area or the palace area. And here we see a picture, a lighter picture with a perspective from the north, north west. And you can see the thing mound in the background and one of the other royal mounds, the east mound, in, also in the background. And there are three characteristics that stand out in the topography. And that those are three large part the artificial mounds. The north mound here, the south mound, south north plateau, south plateau, and up there is what we now today call the eastern plateau. And, um, and they're using the normal to uh, topography in order to create these very large platforms, which is each consists of a couple of thousand of square, uh, cubic meters of earth and soil. <coughs> and each plateau is made of a, uh, an, a different material, and each face is made of a different material. So the, the architects behind these monuments, they never find a model for how they should create a monument. It, it seems like it's, they are constantly experimenting on how they should do it. And so the, the most uh, the most exciting of the buildings, and the building that we have excavated the most so far. This is the southern, southern plateau house, the latest house on the plateau, which we call the Great Hall. It's, it is 50 meters long, 12 meters wide in the middle, and um, you can see... I don't get the arrow here. Yeah, here is the arrow. Perhaps you can see a small figure in order so you can get a perspective of, of the size of the house. And it is, it was past. I should avoid the, mount, the cursor. When, peop, when you wanted to reach the house, you went up along a road here along the plateau. And when you wanted to walk around the house, you had a two meter wide rampart so you can reach the house from every direction. And it's divided into three rooms, a southern gable room, a hall room, and a northern gable room. Um, each has four, four entrances to the house. We have two entrances here and two entrances in the, in the northern part. The hall room is about 200 square meters large, and we have no indication so far that it has any sub subdivisions inside the house. It also has double walls. It has been a very much discussed thing whether it is two houses or not, but we can now say for certainty that we have an outer wall made out of staves. So it's one of the earliest certain stave constructions or very large planks, perhaps 
that we have in Scandinavia, and then in the wall with clay, clay and woodland dog clay, which has been whitewashed. So it, it has looked more, seems to have looked more like you know um, an Elizabethanian house where you have small cassettes of the clay between wooden beams. And so it has been a white shining hall, not more of a Roman villa impression than a dark barbarian thing. And here is student Joachim standing in, inside, inside in, in one of the northern entrances. We had one of the gable posts, and an entrance post was here. You see a small concentration of stones. He went up there, and Joachim is standing right on one of the on the post in the middle. And this entrance is something really extraordinary. It's three and a half meters wide, so five men in a in a row can go inside the house. We even have two frost nails from horses in these entrances. They were probably riding into the hall. Is it? In Inglingatal, in Heimskring, it's mentioned how a king rides into the hall and falls off his horse and dies and so on. So it's very exciting. But, uh, but, uh, and we have clear indications of, because of some iron decorations that we see here, that the northern entrances are, have, are both wider and they're having these decorations, so indications of that this is the parade entrance into the hall. The southern entrances do not are uh, tighter, not slightly tighter, and do not have th that many iron decorations. So we have it. Most of them are spirals that we normally find on both burials as uh, aft and stern decorations, but we have nail heads here, and they're very flat, so we don't think they're sitting on the Gable, so instead we think there's something like uh, Gabor Thomas has found when he's uh, been excavating his hall buildings in England. We think it's iron decoration in for the doors. And also, here you also see a sword and uh, spear shaped decoration mounts. It, it's wrongly interpreted. It's not a hinge as we interpreted last year. It can't be for logical reasons. But it is, it is something that we really, uh, you can associate it with Odin's spear or something like that if you, if you want to. But I, and we are, I think now that these spirals are part of a modeling kit. They are now found dispersed around the entrances, deposited in post holes and so on. But they were probably included as iron decorations in the doors. And if that is the case, it's, it's 500 years earlier than the earliest medieval iron decorated doors we have in the churches of Sweden. So, so that is, that was a very exciting find. And some of the spirals have, you can see snake heads. So it is actually a snake with a head here. It's corroded and so on, so it's hard to see in most cases. And very st uh, stylized as well. And then we have the second ex uh, house that we have excavated. We have the southern plateau here. The northern gable of it, and here, here we have the northern plateau. We've only excavated 90 square meters of this house, or actually two generations of house. We know nothing at all about what was there before the excavations in 2011, but we know that it was an artificial hill, partly artificial. It's a huge terracing, actually. Um, and it proved to be a workshop house, and if it is a workshop house, and it, if it goes all along the plateau, which we don't know. It could be about 40 meters long. So it's all other workshop houses are max, at maximum 10 meters long. And we know from only three square meters that we excavated in the floor layers, we found 700 chips of garnets for garnet productions. So it, it is probably a very large workshop for bead making and iron smithing. Um, antler working, and then we have the garnets as well. But we, are, we have only exposed the wall line. We have never actually gone down into the floor layers. So it is a true treasure chest. And then we also have the 14th century, not probably the 14th century royal manor in the area, because a steward 
and the bailiff of Uppsala is mentioned, is, is written as belonging to Gamla Uppsala. They don't sit in the town of Uppsala, they sit here instead. So, um, just to get an impression of what remains of these burnt down houses, very nice, we can see in a wall ditch, we can see the staves from out the wall and beams uh, belonging to an inner wall. So this is from the workshop house. And both the houses on the northern plateau and the southern plateau has burnt, burnt down. And it's, they seem to have burnt down in around 800 AD. Most of the datings we have is from the construction uh, elements, so we don't know. We know that when the houses are constructed, not when they are abandoned. And that's a, that's a major problem for us. And especially the southern plateau, the Great Hall, it has been burnt down, and we think it is intentionally, because they have more or less emptied the house before burning it down. And after the burning, they have collected iron decorations, um, pulled up the unburnt parts of the post, deposited the iron decorations in the very bottom of the post holes, placed uh, jaws of cattle and horses on the burnt remains, and then we think they have placed a, a clay lid all over it to close the house after the, after the burning. And even though it is an excellent place for a new house on this elevated position, they have chosen not to build a house there until the 14th century, 15th century, we have a new house on the site. So that is very strange. So that means we are we're having a very hard time to find a Viking Age manor, which I will come back to. <laughs> and then we have the Eastern Plateau that where we made a trail trench last year, very much a close-up uh, on it. It's even larger than the Southern Plateau. It's 80 meters long, very theoretically could ha house a house that is 60 to 70 meters long, and, but we have some problems with it. We will make some major excavations next year, some advertising for that for a couple of weeks. We just got fundings for that. So you must watch our blog next summer. So, inshallah, we, we will excavate. But, and, uh, here on the left picture you can see the wall ditch of the northern plateau house with the burnt remains in it. And here you see the part of the wall ditch we excavate on the eastern plateau. But this construction has not burnt, so we have, don't have any preserved timbers. But it looks very similar to the northern plateau. And now, unfortunately, or I don't know if it's unfortunately, we had the carbon-14 dates were actually the 13th century the 7th century, but we know the plateau is made in the 7th century, so we had a major problem. But they looked at the stratigraphy and said that maybe it was a later disturbance that we took the sample from, so we'll have a new result in, in one or two months. So, but we don't have any 13th century anyway in the area, so it's exciting anyway. So, to sum up for the palace area of the Vendel period, 7th century, we, I've chosen to begin considering it to be a 7th century, to call it a palace, but it, but it, it, but it is because of the grandeur of the, of the area. It seems like it covers uh, 5 hectares in total, the settlement area, and it's like directly together with the big mounds. We have Mona Plateau up north, you see the outline of the house, the southern plateau by H, and the eastern plateau here. And it's all archaeology. There's not there's a there's a feature for every square meter. It's not one square meter without a feature. So we've only excavated two, three percent or something like that. And area in total, we have the manor area, the palace area. All these graves seem to be Viking Age. We have the palisades that Alex mentioned. North south going Palisade Road, east west going. This one we excavated in September, and because it was magnetometry anomal anomalies, it proved to be nothing. And I haven't changed my PowerPoint, so. This, but this row has to be uh, abandoned. And this one 
should be moved southwards. So we now know it on this right here. So the Viking Age is is a problem we, because we don't have a manner. Uh, so if we really want to have a manner, we can't say empirically, here is the manner. Uh, but we have a set, one settlement area here. We have one in the north with very nice fine materials, sword fragments and hack silver and so on. But otherwise, it's scattered remains. So the literary sources say we should have a Viking manor here. It's, it is royal property, but we don't have the hardcore evidence for it yet. But we do have indications of a different form of regulated settlement system in that period with ditches that you can relate to tough ditches. There is, there, is a, there is a change in the settlement system in the area, but we cannot pinpoint what it really means yet. And two minutes for the medieval period. Um, in the medieval period, so something happens uh, around 1120. This, the king gives part of the village to, uh, to the bishop in 1120s. And from that period, we have the chess garden. This is the uh, church uh, institution having this part of Gamla Uppsala. King remains having a royal manor in the area, so we have probably have two royal manors at the same time. And then we have the church village, the ordinary village. Uh, here it is. And that was one accident in 2011 from the Northern Plateau. We discovered a cellar that we couldn't, that we didn't expect to find, because there were no excavation, uh, indication that the pit had been filled up in the 17th century. And it is, seems to be a, a place with very high status. We have uh, weapons and imported uh, German pottery and gla stained glass fragments. And stained glass is something we never find except for in churches. And it is 14th century. So it must be some form of major importance. And that's why we relate, that's why we relate it to the bailiff of Uppsala or the royal steward that the documents mention. And as well, we, we've had major problems in understanding the, the medieval period as well. But now we have indications of, I should mention that this is the cathedral. I forgot to have a picture of it. it the, all of it remaining is the central tower and the choir. The long house, which is extended out here, is God when the church moved to present day Uppsala. But we have probably a royal manor up there, and next year we think we have the arch, the bishop's palace here. We think these are cellar pits from the medieval period, very large pits, which has been ignored, but now we think it is cellar pits. So we'll see if we're lucky or not. Um, well, is it an assembly or not? No one, nobody doubts whether Gamla Uppsala is a thing site or whether it is an assembly. The question is when it is, a, is it an assembly and when is it a thing site? Or, and there, and archaeologically, um, there, uh, there are some problems finding, for example, the Viking Age rituals. We don't have one single amulet from the palace area in the Viking Age. But in the village area, we have hundreds. There are hundreds that they have excavated related to single farms, which have their own ritual sites. So there are loads and loads of question marks. And we don't have, we still don't have a large area like, like a Danish shore site or something like that with a pit house area without permanent dwellings where you can see that here have people come, visit, had their temporary dwellings or something like that. That kind of area we haven't found yet. So, thank you.